And just to provide some scale there, outside of the banking system, Matterhorn is the leading provider of gold and silver storage for private investors. Is that correct? Yeah, for, for, for high net worth individuals, yes. Yeah. Now, a cool facts we could uh, maybe jump into on that front is your vaults. I think it's called Gold Mountain. Just to give people a bit of context, when you say you store precious metals, that can mean a number of things. Gold Mountain is one of your vaults. Correct me if I'm it's wrong. Not, it's not called Gold Mountain, but it doesn't matter. It, it's a, we, we, don't, we don't have a name for it. It's, you should uh, call it's it Gold a, yeah, we can call it Gold Mountain. I don't know if anybody else does, but let's call it Gold Mountain. It's a vault in the Alps, Swiss Alps. It's the biggest private gold vault in the world. Um, and it's got a security which is um, James Bond-like. You know, it's got, it's got 10 security zones, and, and some of them have to be opened remotely from hidden security centers, etc. So it's very special. No, not the American style guards standing outside with machine guns. Uh, it, it's the mountain that protects the gold. So that's for high, higher end clients. So that the minimum in that vault is five million dollars. And then we have vaults in in uh, in Zurich and and uh, also other places in the world uh, that where the minimum is four hundred thousand. So so we are catering for uh, bigger uh, investors. Uh, obviously, smaller investors complain and say, "Can't you help us?" But we have a we have a, a association with with a company that I'm on the board of also that that can do that for smaller investors because we do understand that everybody should hold gold. It's just that our system caters for for the more wealthy individuals and, and, and institutions, pension funds, etc. Okay, and I just want to pry in the security system a little bit more because I'm I'm super curious about how this functions. Yeah, okay. so the vault is actually it's bored into a mountain, correct? And then when you say let, let me know if that's right. And then you say 10 security systems. So if somebody wants to access their gold in let, let's call it gold mountain just for my sake, because I love it. Yeah. What's yeah. the process? How do they go ahead and, and get access yeah. and enter? So, so the process is that uh, you obviously, you have to make an appointment because you have to, you know, you, you have to uh, open all, be, be, be ready to open all the security systems. So we, um, for example, uh, you stand uh, outside the vault and then um, they check you out on cameras already uh, outside that. And, um, you know, there has to be at least three people, um, you know, six, six eyes principle. Um, uh, and then so, so they know that you, you've already had security checks on the people. Uh, and then basically you go through zone after zone uh, that uh, the, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it, it's an exclusive if you want. Or so they open up. Some of them cannot be opened up on the spot, and some of them you must contact the security center, uh, two security centers to open them up. So it's a, it's very high level security, um, and you know guards play, play play no role in, in 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 security at that level because it's all about the structure that protects you. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, guards, for example, you know, guard, guards don't carry weapons, uh, for example, because that's a security risk also if they do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, right. And fairly uh, remote, right? I believe there's an airstrip right outside for people that want to land. Right correct. Outside. You can land with your, your with the, with a small, yeah. sm smaller private jet or helicopter or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Fun. Exciting. Okay. Thanks for sharing on that. I was curious. I appreciate that. Yes. No, it is, you know, you should come one day and, and visit. You know, we, are, we don't. We're not advertising it. We're not saying where it is. Obviously, clients can't come and see it. Uh, and, you know, we can't touch clients' gold without their authorization because the security arrangements are such, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's very high level. Um, and um, it's in a nice area of Switzerland to come to anyway. So, so, so um, yeah, it's w worth seeing. I'm sure you can't disclose who your clients are, but I'd be super curious if there's anybody who stores gold who might surprise my audience who is storing gold privately in your vault, you know, I'm thinking like sovereign nations, governments, other than just independently private, privately wealthy investors. Yeah, not really. There are, you know, the, the, you know, you have to be so careful with, with now compliance reasons for, for sure. If a, a small government, if they are from in the right area, uh, could store gold there. Uh, but otherwise, you know, political persons, you've got to be very careful uh, about because uh, that, that makes the risk a lot higher. So um, I you know, generally, I don't think anybody would surprise you. It's just wealthy uh, individuals who are worried about uh, their assets, protecting their assets. 
Okay. All right. I'll leave it alone then. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay. So we jumped on the call and the first thing you said is the world's a bit of a mess, right? Um, and so we're just trying to make sense of it. So what's catching your attention right now, Egon, that maybe people are underestimating or misinterpreting? You know, I'm pretty boring because uh, for 20 years, <laughs> I've given the same message. And, and some people are, of course, uh, get, get bored because if you buy a, an asset like gold or, and silver, which we have, well, a smaller part of because it's too volatile, but we do have silver also for clients. Uh, if you buy that, you're not buying it for instant gratification, then, then you're the wrong buyer and definitely the wrong client for us. Uh, we don't want people who go in and out and trade and, and, and buy and then want to sell quickly when it goes up. And we don't have those um, uh, as clients either. We, we think that people should uh, invest and hold gold for pure long-term wealth preservation uh, purposes. I mean, this, we're talking about generational wealth here. Uh, and and uh, very few th people think about in those terms today because it's all about the instant gratification of you know, Bitcoin going up or stock market going up, which it has done now for a very long time. So why hold gold? It's so boring. Yeah, but that's just the whole uh, <laughs> the beauty of gold. You know, the boring part. It is. It is. It doesn't move quickly. It is not volatile, um, uh, and it has over time been the only currency that has survived uh, for, for thousands of years. Every single currency in history has gone down to its intrinsic value of zero. It's very simple. Um, and therefore, you hold gold just to protect against um, those historical facts that always, always happen. People always think it's different today, but it isn't different today. It's never been different in history. Bitcoin is not going to change the monetary system or cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, and, and if it does, well, that might take thousands of years. So I, I don't, I, I don't know, see anything that will replace this for the purpose of wealth preservation. So from that point of view, you know, we, we are boring, as I said, because, you know, what, what, what the Fed said yesterday, or they're going to taper or not taper, it makes no difference. Yeah, I can just look at history and look at history, and that's totally consistent. We, we've never seen, you know, the, the, over time, Gold always reflects the, the, the dying currencies. And since they've all died, it's a very, very, very easy equation. Uh, gold, all gold does over time is to hold um, its purchasing power. Now, within that, there are, of course, fluctuations. And so now uh, we've seen in this century, uh, always since, since 71, really, when, when Nixon closed the gold window, um, and accelerating in this century, we've seen more creation of money than ever. You know, it's gone exponential, totally. Global debt was just under 100 trillion in, in around 2000, and now it's 300 trillion. We don't, nobody ever sees the derivative figures, or certainly not the true ones, but global derivatives is certainly a quadrillion and a half, if not, if not more today. And, and that is a form of debt too, because it, it, the way I look at the world, that will become debt, because uh, at some point, um, the central banks will, will need to rescue the banks when, when uh, they're starting to, uh, the, the derivatives start to implode. Derivatives are wonderful for the buyers when they go up and, and when there's liquidity. But when there's no liquidity and people want to get out of derivatives, there'll be no market, there'll be no counterparty. Uh, and therefore, when counterparty fails, the, the, the gross um, the, the gross risk uh, rem is the same as the net risk. So then we're talking about you know, possibly printing uh, up to uh, one, uh, one and a half quadrillion or more. So these are the, you know, I'm not a prophet of doom and gloom, but my, my, people think that, you know, this is this guy, you know, he's depressing. But, you know, that's not the way I look at life. I look at things from the point of view of risk. Um, and the risk to me is greater than ever. The, 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 obviously, the debt bubble is, is the biggest risk. And then that has, that has affected all the other uh, bubbles in, in, in this everything bubble market. So you have stock market bubble, you have bond, bond market bu uh, bubble, you have property market bubble. So these are all bubbles, uh, the effect as an effect of uh, the money printing. And, you know, it's not the U.S. hasn't had a real uh, the, or the U.S. debt, federal debt has increased every year since 1930 with you know, four years exception in the 50s and the 60s. 
and and the uh, and the Clinton years were not were were not surpluses. They, they were they they were actually deficits. It was just cheating. And if because if you look at the debt during the Clinton years, the, the, the debt was actually going up. Um, so so there were no real surpluses at all. So that shows you how can an economy that basically has had a ha, had a debt increasing for ninety years. How do you think that economy, how sound, sound can that economy be? We're living on air. We're living on printed money. We're, we're living on money that, that it suits everybody to call it real money because people have a vested interest. And, and so therefore, everybody, nobody wants, dares to shout, you know, the emperor is, uh, has no clothes. Nobody dares to shout because the people in power, it suits them that to say that oh, everything is wonderful. Uh, and that, uh, and that's why you know. So these are the risks I look at. These are the risks that that we help people to protect against. Um, and then in the meantime, you, you know, you don't have to worry about daily market because mm. you know what the Fed sa- says short term has zero influence uh, on the medium or longer term. It's just for the day traders uh, that take enormous position. But the, but otherwise, you know, the Fed ne- doesn't know anything basically. Uh, well, they do. I mean, they have a lot of information, but they're misinterpreted all the time. Uh, uh, and I mean, they never forecast any problem or any uh, any disaster in the economy. Um, they're always wrong on interest rates. They're always behind the curve. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the um, central bank shouldn't really have the role they have at all. If they, are, or they, they probably shouldn't exist even at all. Um, but they are there and everybody pays so much attention to them. Of course, we have a market, as I said before, that is based on short term speculation. Um, and, and therefore, for the speculators, it has a major influence, of course. Um, but for the long term investors, it has none. You know, you say you take the wealthy families in Europe, in France, for example, et cetera, they say, you should hold one third cat, one sh- one third property. They have their estates, wh- one third art, and one third gold. You know that's what long term right. money does, and then they don't worry. Uh, uh, right. uh, rather than speculate in stock markets, sure, enormous f- fortunes have been made in stocks, has been made in in, in uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, etc. But that's not what long term wealth preservation is about. The way we look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, so that makes sense. And that ratio, for example, that's a good, that's a good thread to pull on, you know, long-term serious wealth preservation. You know, you describe one, one portfolio allocation of a third gold, a third art and a third cash, right? Which mm. makes sense if your goal is to preserve the wealth that you have. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, what's, how do we get around the short-term mindset that investors so often fall victim to where they're hyper-reacting to whatever Fed uh, headline comes out? That's all the media talks about is what the Fed's saying right now, right? This tapering announcement two days ago it was all over the press, but it really doesn't affect and didn't affect anything. The market didn't even respond to it, but investors and media obsess over these minute-by-minute details, losing sight of the bigger picture uh, and I, I kind of understand why, because, you know, if your goal is to preserve the wealth that you have, what you said makes sense. But if you're looking at everybody else's wealth around you and you want some of that, then I can understand the draw to speculations. I mean, I'm a speculator, right? I, I speculate on super early stage technology companies, super early stage uh, mineral exploration companies, precious metals companies, all of this, right? I love the early stage, super high risk market. But the reason I know this from personal experience over the last 12 years of, of playing this market, you know, that's why I own physical gold, because it gives me the confidence to make those high risk, high return uh, bets or, or chase those high risk, high return opportunities. And that, I think, is a really, really important message that I would love to help people understand. Now, I'm not a gold bug by any stretch, but I own physical gold and and enough of it that I know I'd be good for quite a lot of quite a lot of time if my income was shut off and my and my fiat currency was wiped out to my portfolio crashed. Right? That's what it is to me. It's like that last minute insurance policy, the last ditch insurance policy. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, you said your your approach is boring because you focus on such a long term long-term cycles, but that's why I wanted you on the show is because investors get so wrapped up in what happens today, you know, and it's to their own detriment. Whereas if you're able to step back 
and look at the long term. It's the same as an entrepreneur working in their business versus working on their business, right? Mm -hmm. You get lost in the trenches, you, you miss the big.